Okay, we're going to call a meeting to order. Um, we do have a quorum, and it's 611. Um, and today, our meeting, we are going to be doing a lot of uh, planning uh, today um, in our meeting to sort of uh, map out our year and the things that we're going to be working on. Um, so it should be uh, a good and thoughtful meeting. Um, I'm going to roll right into public comment, and it looks like we have a nice group of folks here who I'm assuming would like to share some comments with us. I think we just shared with Heather, but I would like to Stick share with the whole board. Okay. Um, can, oh, can I just inter interrupt just for one second? If you could just state your name yeah. and the community my you're town. from, that would be helpful. Um, Thank Pam you. Overstrom. Um, Randolph is my town, and I'm the um, Randolph Area Asylum Seekers Support um, Volunteer Coordinator. And we're here um, uh, to speak with Heather about uh, equity policy. I have to tell you, our family, we have a family from the Ivory Coast for the whole last year. The school has been wonderful. The teachers have been wonderful. They have really made um, Esther and Naomi, ages 9 and 11 now, feel um, welcome. So kudos to you. And um, we will be at your forums. We will be supporting the development of a, uh, equity policy, which we desperately need. One, two, three, four of us are all on the Randolph Area Sound Seekers board, and um, that's what, well, volunteers, and that's why we're here. I'm Wendy Ross. This is Cynthia Jackson. This is. I, I'm Neil Richardson, but I'm here partly because of the group focus on racial equality. Same thing. And, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm here because I'm concerned with the ethnic studies group. And I understand the report from the working group has been um, submitted or something, and towns are starting to act on it. At least that's what I've been told. And I hope that Randolph will act on it at some point. I'm not with this group, and yeah, I am with this group. I'm Martha Mathis. I'm from Westbrook Field, and my daughter, gosh, Kit Gage Air, um, with the elementary school here. Um, Randolph Union High School. So I just retired uh, from Norwich University after 32 years. Um, so I'm curious um, not only how students are studying these days, but obviously what. Um, I know in the colleges, you know, there's always this, this focus on getting them prepared to enter a diverse world. And I think if you're in college and you're just thinking that you're probably going to move to me. Um, so I'm just curious, getting back to uh, public school system uh, after my daughter is 38, so I'll let you do that. <laughs> It'd be nice, though, if you could do what we're doing, because none of your faces look familiar to me either. <laughs> so we'll start over here. Sure, I'm Hannah Arias. I'm a Randolph representative. Thank you. I know your name. <laughs> uh, Scott Poa, representative for Brookfield. Thank you. Um, oh. Chelsea Sprague, I'm also a representative from Brookfield. Chelsea. Yes. yes. <laughs> Ann Kaplan, and I'm a rep for Randolph. Uh, Katja Evans, I'm the rep from Braintree. Clay Gillington, superintendent, and Randolph resident. And Heather Long, assistant superintendent and equity coordinator. And online we have, can we can we let Megan, can you speak, Megan? Hi, yeah, I'm Megan Salt from Randolph. Great. Okay. Um, and we do have uh, Susan Mills and Addison Pickett online, it looks like. Um, do either of you have a comment for the board? Uh, I, I don't at this time, no. Not right now. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> All right. So just for clarification, 
because sometimes it's very strange for folks to come, they give a public comment and we don't really respond or, or do anything with it. And that's because it's public comment and, and we just are here to listen just to make sure that you're all aware of the procedure. Um, so moving forward, um, we're gonna move into our first task as a board. And um, from the last meeting, um, one of the things that we uh, decided to do as a board was to take a look at the state's uh, portrait of a graduate um, and, and look at it and figure out what aspects you like, don't like, if you like the whole thing, if you wanted to add some, so that we could take a look at that as well as our ends and maybe see if um, we could use that information to then go out and check in with our community in terms of where we are with our ends and giving a little more clarification um, to the administration in terms of the outcomes that we're looking for. Um, so hopefully everyone has had a chance to take a look at it. And we, there, were, there are several different schools in Vermont that have a portrait of a graduate, but we just wanted to focus on the one that the state put out as a sample for, for districts to take a look at. Um, so I'm curious, did everyone get a chance to take a look at that? Yeah. Yeah, And um, so uh, I, was, I was struggling a little bit with sort of how we wanna kind of come up, what, what we had talked about the last meeting was coming up with sort of our own sort of board version of the portrait of the of the graduate. Um, and then as I was looking at it myself, one of the things that I was thinking about was I pulled up a copy of our ends and I thought, okay, um, where do these different aspects of a portrait of a graduate sort of fit into our ends um, so that we could use that portrait of a graduate to just sort of be more specific in our ends policies because our ends policies are very general. I think not everyone in the room understands the concept of ends if there's a brief, right, right. brief statement. <laughs> so, so, um, so what we're talking about is the way that we sort of govern as a board is we are looking at the outcomes that we want our district to um, reach with all of the students and we're looking at the system K through 12 <coughs> and um, so we have ENDS policies that are currently online they're um, fairly uh, vague and one of the things we've heard from the administrators is um, it would be helpful for us for you to make them a little bit more specific and so um, that's sort of our next uh, phase is to sort of, as a board, take a look at some ways to maybe be more specific and then over this year, reach out to community members to say, what do you think about this? Is this really what we mean? Is this what we want our graduates to come away with? And um, given your comments earlier, one of the, the um, outcomes in the portrait of a graduate is global citizenship. So um, that's, that's one of the pieces that we have. Uh, so maybe before we start sharing, do we wanna kind of brainstorm how we might wanna do it? Like maybe um, create sort of have a, piece of paper. I don't know if everyone, I mean, what one of the things I'll that I found was I liked the whole thing. So I was like, I don't want to get rid of any of it. Um, but I wonder if, uh, I can take this. okay. Oh, 
Right. Sir, I, I, you know, I thought this was a good place, like a, a good starting point. Um, there were, I did end up looking at a lot of different uh, examples of other Vermont schools that have created ends and I, or end, um, portions of a graduate. And I definitely felt like there was some language in here that was still rather vague. Um, and maybe, you know, obviously we're looking at when they're doing a Vermont portrait, you're kind of looking at overall, but I think that this is our opportunity to look a little bit more specific for our just nuances in our own community. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there were, um, yeah, there were a couple others that I looked up that I kind of liked the language and the wording and um, a little bit more of the clarification and made things a little bit just kind of more firm in what they were looking for um, and took out some of the vagueness of what I think this one Mm -hmm. Can you give us an example of, of what you saw? Um, you I saw remember? what I like was collaborator respects divergent thinking to engage others in thoughtful conversation. Under the ethical yeah. global citizen, acknowledges, understands diverse perspectives and cultures when considering local, national, and world issues, contributes to solutions that benefit the broader community, promotes environmental stewardship, demonstrates empathy, compassion, and respect for others. Um, Goal-directed resiliency shows strong understanding and belief to self in, of self to engage in reflection for individual improvement and advocacy. I thought like that was a good one for behavioral stuff. Um, persists, persists to overcome difficult tasks and uses time and financial resources wisely. D the second that you read um, speaks, I think, very well to my problem with how they, the global citizenship piece is in this in one, this one. Um, because it does uh, uh, narrow down to, uh, um, well, an empathy, too, for the local surroundings and then getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think this, it's just too umbrella. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do we want to, um, do we want to take each sort of area and see if we want to narrow it, come to a consensus on when we're talking about learner agency, sort of. So taking those headers and kind of create. Right, and create kind of our own based on that. I mean, I think it would be worthwhile. I guess what would others, what, how do others feel about the process <laughs> of trying to translate this to what our student looks like when they are walking on that stage. Are we doing it all tonight? I think we're doing as much as we can. Yeah, as we much as we is, can. Yeah, I mean, even right. if we get two of these done, that's a start. Right, right. In the time allotted, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yep. I got my watch on. Perfect. So learner agency, student takes ownership of their own learning. Students develop their own voice and the ability to use it in a variety of settings. Students have high expectations for selves and see themselves as lifelong learners. But you had one there that I thought, again, kind of um, hammered down more specifically. It was about independent thought. Yeah. Uh, and sense of self. Oh, show strong understanding and belief of self to engage in reflection for individual improvement and advocacy. That one? Yes. Hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> because there's something about how that reads that is a continuing, it's not just uh, uh, have high expectations, but that it's a developing, because it's not done when they graduate, right? Right, right. So what do you think of number two then? Do you feel like students develop their own voice and the ability to use it in a variety of settings? That that that's covered in what she, what she said there as well. Students develop their own voice and the ability to use it in a variety of settings. Students 
students take ownership of their own learning. That sort of encapsulated that as well, no? So when you think about that student and this in, in framing this kind of like learner, the learner agency, and that's, you know, thinking about how they themselves are, um, oops, sorry, um, have grown as an individual. Um, is there anything that you, like any words, any thoughts, any like adjectives that come to mind that, that, that we could kind of use to spur on some conversation around this? Megan, do you have anything that you have thought of with that first learner agency specifically? Are you, sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing what. Um, are you talking about number two on learner agency? Yeah, just that, just, just or that any first account. learner agency. Is there anything that kind of strikes you or that you feel? Um. Not necessarily. I, I was kind of feeling like, I don't know, when I'm looking at these, I don't want to, um, I don't want to make them too broad when we're, when we are looking at these, but I don't know. Like how de how detailed that was kind of my overall question. Sorry, and maybe you said this and I and I missed it. I'm just wondering like how um, this is a this is a good starting place for sure on this one. Um, but it's uh, there's I don't know like how detailed should we get for these? So remember that when we what we put out so with our ends what we do is we're, we're looking at some, we're gonna always start on sort of the broadest level of, of expectation. And then, then that leaves the professional educators to then interpret what that means. And, and as long as it's reasonable, which in many, and, and they have a rationale behind that interpretation, then we can understand sort of where they're going. And if we think, wait a minute, that isn't really what we meant by that, then we can always go in and, and specify down a little bit further. Um, so remember with, with, our, with, with the way our system works, we do wanna leave it fairly broad so that the educators can kind of be uh, interpreting it down a little bit further and, okay. and interpret it down through the grade level. So we're sort of looking at the very, very top at the end, you know, when they, when they graduate, when they go across the stage and get their diploma, what do we, what do we want it, them to be looking like? And sure. then now my other question, um, is I, um, who so we don't currently have like a portrait of a senior which is why we're creating this who um who is going to own this or are students going to be able to see this you know like obviously and a kindergartner isn't going to understand you know this is what we're aiming towards but at what point do we take this document and do we involve the parents and the students and and have this information of what what our school community wants our seniors to graduate and and be able to achieve all of these like when do we include them in this so it's a, it's a good question so if you have a well-developed set of policies at the end of the process um, after the interpretation that will be translated into most likely the graduation requirements for students that they are responsible for for meeting and we're responsible for getting them there um, okay good. so that'll be in their, their student handbook okay it'll be part of their handbook and so 
um, that and that would involve parents, students, teachers, and then that they that gives them something to kind of focus on as they go through all of their years in school. Well, yeah. and I think that the purpose was to ha you, uh, use this as a tool to build our ownership linkage, right? So this is a start, a jumping off point to say, this is what we think. Are we right on? Is this, is this how you want our graduates to, to uh, look like when they graduate? Right. Or and are we off track? And then what we'll do is then we're gonna update these ends so, so that's where there's gonna, and we may end up sort of adding something to the ends because right now, you know, if we look at our ends as they currently are, we don't have something specifically that talks about global citizenship. Now that doesn't mean that there is nothing happening in the schools currently around global citizenship. It's just that we have social studies. But we didn't specify to the administration what in the social studies do we want you to prioritize. Now, um, we've said we, you, we want you to provide foundational no knowledge, and the administration has said, okay, our interpretation of that is we're going to follow the common core that the state of Vermont has developed, and it means these standards in social studies and those standards include global citizenship standards. So, so there is some stuff that's happening, but it's, if we, it's a little bit easier to, to think about, or at least it seemed in, in theory anyway, to think about what outcome and do we want our graduates to have? What do we want them to look like when they walk across the stage? What skills do we want them to have? What knowledge do, do we want them to have? How do we want them to behave in the world? Um, and the ends are a little bit harder to, to use to have that dialogue with, with the public. So we were thinking the portrait of the graduate might be a little bit easier and then we can use that input to then massage our ends to make sure that we're incorporating those things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my other question is, as we um, are developing this and kind of making this part of the step of the ownership linkage plan that we're working on, um, I know we talked about kind of doing one, one small bit at a time, just until we can get our hands on what we wanna do moving forward. So um, as far, in my mind, as you know, looking at this this guidance from, um, oops, sorry, I'm having a hard time opening it on my computer, so I'm looking at my phone. But um, as as we're looking at this, um, I feel like this this specific Vermont um, version that we're looking at, it, it's not a horrible place to start for sure. I was thinking it was a little less um, wordy than I thought it would be, but in a sense that we're just using this as our first step, um, I guess, as a group, if we're talking about, um, you know, what's here that we like, and then what we feel like could be added to it, and then taking that and not, not making it too, too much, so we can move forward with, you know, figuring out what our next step is going to be. But I thought, in general, this wasn't a bad place to start. Sorry, that was really long-winded. <laughs> I've had a long week. <laughs> That's okay. So you, you, in general, you you liked you liked yeah, the sounds yeah, of this I one. Yeah, I thought it was a good starting place. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, any other reflections? I'm curious what you're thinking. You you so have I, a graduate. I know. So like, I'm like, what would I hope for my graduate as she's graduating this next year? And honestly, taking ownership of their own learning, like all of all of these are important. But really, what do I want for her? I want her to graduate. I want her to, you know, be able to explore her next phase and feel confident doing that. So 
I think that starts way before your senior year, and I think that could be done better at this school. And um, I feel like it's a little vague, this learner agency piece of it. Like I'm like, I think learner agency and academic proficiency should be combined, but maybe that's not true because, you know, I'm having a hard time sort of pinning down specifics reading this mm -hmm. <laughs> but what do I want for her I want her to when she's in ninth grade you know have meetings with the um, guidance counselors saying this is what it's looking like these are the classes you should be taking and I and I think that that's supposed to be happening I'm not sure it's happening all that well so am I hearing maybe a little more guidance in terms of, so we might want to add something in here about uh, some guidance to looking toward the future? I'm trying to think if there was anything. Well, so in um, academic proficiency, one? students acknowledge their growth and identify possibilities for continued learning. So um, it's kind of in there, you know. But maybe you want to add a career? Piece there it's it's not even career it's like it's like sort of what are you interested in and what are you excited about doing when you are out of our school you know are you excited about your career are you excited about college are you excited about your gap year are you excited about the possibilities of starting somewhere and it being okay to change your mind and go somewhere else but just so like guidance and fostering the, uh, the future the, for these kids because I think sometimes they graduate and they're just like I don't they know don't have that. Like, a, like fostering independent growth in that sense too. I wonder is it under well-being at all maybe well -being I don't know if I'm saying no, what I, I mean no, no. well it's interesting that you say you think two should be combined because I see learner agency and I think it goes with communication because if they have their own voice and they need to use it in a variety of settings then they've got to know how to communicate yes, right for sure there's yes. it's it all um, yes. there are bridges under all of these well and that's, of honestly these. that's one of the things that I feel is very specific and this is I think just because I'm such a visual person um, but I see this more as like the overlapping circles because all of yeah. these things are overlapping in the student that we want to. And so I think mm -hmm. when personally, when we present this, I just want it presented in a different format, format to show that these are all things that like we're looking at our students in that holistic way. And these are all things that connected. So your learning your agency is going to inform your collaboration and your global citizenship. And there's going to be I think that's a good idea. That kind of so I think like the first step the is are we the circles overlapping? Yeah. Are we good with these being the buckets, the circles? These specific titles or categories are. Um, I I um. I there was one that I I didn't see anything about artistic expression anywhere in here. I was like, where are the arts and music? And there there doesn't seem to be anything. And then I was thinking, or is that just put up in foundational, in that essential concepts and academic domains? Or, so I added it under communication. I added another, a number four. That's where I'm like, oh no, here I go. I'm making it bigger instead of smaller. But I added students uh, communicate, uh, uh, what did I write? Students communicate using the arts. Well, it's interesting they included body language, which I guess is Yeah, rare. yeah. Well, well, but see, that's, that I thought was more related to like a, a presentation to be aware of maybe your body language when you're presenting. It seemed more academic focused rather than theater or music or, you know, yeah. And so that's where I was like, wait a minute, there's, an, I'm not seeing anything in here. And to me, that's a really important thing for students to have experience doing, um, even 
you know, I think students learn a lot about themselves getting up on stage in, in a variety of different ways. Um, well, I think that's where our ends be real will be able to be more engagement, draw down right. into that kind of specific stuff too. Right. Cause I, but I, I don't know if people would agree that communicating I through the arts. I do think the arts and communicating through them are important. There's so many things that are important. How do we like, organize them so that they're thoughtfully presented? And I do, I mean, I, I agree. I do feel that when we start, if we start to talk about things individually like that, we're gonna, we're gonna pull ourselves a little too specific into that, whereas mm -hmm. that's gonna be able to be addressed in the ends and through what the administration interprets as the ends. So I think that if there is, there can be an expression of that through like, um, inclusive you know uh, you know i don't know how we say that but we can put it in the wording as being like all all facets of education are you know um, part of a student's learning experience and then we can drill down like we have this in our ends the arts is one of our ends right now right, right. um but i i would i would kind of caution us to not start getting too specific with with that kind of language in our portrait of a graduate. Um, because I think we can we can relay that in, in wording that then we make more specific mm -hmm. in our ends that then is interpreted by our administrators. Mm -hmm. So where do you see uh, that fitting in? In, I mean, I think that would be part of academic proficiency. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, you can look at glo global citizenship too, you know, as far as, you know, um, when we talk about culture, that kind of also brings into play like artistic expression and um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Diverse. diverse, yeah, yeah diversity. Think about the phrase global citizenship, that is just not, I don't like but I, um, it seems, I don't know, not what I want it to mean. Um, uh, I don't know, there's something dry about it or uh, I don't have another, um, I guess part of my problem with it, like number three, they'll learn another language. That's still very academically focused. And I think it recognizing that it's increasingly, it, it, these don't seem current enough. I, I mean, that's, I'm I think not, that's, that's I when I, this. when I read this other one that was like the considering local, national and world issues and contributes to solutions that benefit the broader community. Cause I thought of that as like the broader community is like their community in school, their community mm -hmm. surrounding them. They're, you know, like it kind of like, it's that, it's that the, ripple the effect levels, of like, the yeah, of all the different levels of what, how do we define community, you know? And that again, is going to be up for interpretation. Is it? direct community within school? Is it reaching out? Right. Um, well, and I guess saying global takes away from, or it implies taking away from the local also is understanding other people. You know, it, mm -hmm. and, and I am not opposed to learning another language at all, but that's like skipping the the school community, the local community, the, the state community, state. the national community. Yeah. It's skipping all of those. Mm -hmm. And again, but see, that's where it depends on the interpretation from the administration and how we translate it mm -hmm. into our ends policies, our ends goals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Scott, what do you think? I haven't heard you this yet. Well, I, no, I, I are we too far in the weeds? <laughs> I mean, we're we're tasked to talk about something that's 
broad and we were just off on tangents in regards to being too laser focused. Let's focus on that broad piece, you know, is, and this may be a stepping stone, whether we change the language in it or not, that's, that's fine, but that's too getting kind of focused. Let's stay that broad, you know, this is a stepping stone. Do we want to add something more to find it? Staying within this realm mm -hmm. is kind of where I'm at, where we're talking about other things that we're just not talking about what we need to talk about, I guess. That's what I think, if that makes any sense. So, um, so are you thinking that we just sort of go with what this has, I, stick I, I, with the... I, I think this is a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. Does it fit our district? Mm -hmm. You know, and, but I think if we're going to add anything to this, we have to keep it broad, not laser focused, what, mm -hmm. what we were just kind of talking about. But I think we should use this as a stepping stone and add whatever we choose. And then when you're talking about your ends, that's where we can be a little bit more focused, but we're not there yet. Let's do this first. And then we can be focused in with whatever our ends may be. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little confused though, then what the, the direction of this discussion should be. You know, I, I understand, although I'm really bad at not getting in the weeds, um, but I, I wonder how we can have a conversation about whether these work for us without. Well, yeah, what I'm wondering is, because I found this helpful, what I found helpful as I was going through it, because at first I was like, well, they seemed, they seemed great to me for the most part, except that the, the arts part. But then I was looking at the, the, the essential concepts in academic domains and I thought, okay, well maybe that incorporates them. But what I did was I then sort of looked at our ends and said, okay, um, so our ends are students have the knowledge and skills or have the knowledge, skills, and tools to be prepared for the next stage of their lives, which justify the resources invested by the community. Further, our core focus is on the following, critical thinking. Students creatively apply experiences and critical analysis to solve problems and make informed decisions. So if you look at academic proficiency, um, number one and number two, um, definitely kind of fit in there. Well, in critical thinking and problem solving. Oh, right, right, right. So it's sort of like, you know, we could, I mean, do we want to enumerate a little bit more clearly? And again, maybe what we need to do is turn over to our administrators and say, because 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 part of the problem has been we've been hearing I don't know what you mean by criti critical thinking and what we've given you and so I I mean if we we we've defined it but it doesn't it's never felt like people were satisfied with our interpretation. Well, I'm kind of wondering too. Like when I'm reading when I'm looking at this portrait of a graduate and then hearing that I'm like that is just very very big. Um, would when you have these like if you had an end be um students evaluate information critically like like these would these ever be appropriate across every realm across one realm and, and what so you you guys are having trouble with this conversation for the same reason that we have trouble with how general or i have trouble with how general the ends are you have this huge broad um piece we have interpreted it, or I have interpreted it based upon what the research says is best, best for kids and what you know, common educational practices. But, but my going through the ENDS presentations over the course of time, it doesn't feel like people are satisfied with that. And so that's why I keep bringing it up. I'm happy, I'm happy with the interpretations that are, that are there. Um, some of them need to be refined and will be as the curriculum, the separate curriculum teams get started this fall. Um, but it, my biggest, my bigger concern is it never felt like the board was satisfied with those interpretations. 
And I, and I guess my question is, if we come up with this portrait of a student, like if, if, if we had like the end is learner agency, students take ownership of their own learning, like is that more, would that provide more guidance? Um, maybe. Okay. I think my observation is, is that you're starting out with this huge broad thing that you're discussing right now. Break it down into smaller chunks. Decide, you know, to use the expressions from the readings, to decide the buckets you want, the general buckets you want, and then go after whether or not you need to meet. You as a board want to make them more specific uh, if you have a, a general intent that you want to throw away um, in terms of what you do. Otherwise, you get what you get in terms of our interpretation. I will guarantee um, that it will be based upon, you know, best best practice, and, and, but uh, it may, may not be what you want unless you're more specific. But again, the only reason that I keep bringing it up is I, I always walk away feeling like people aren't satisfied. And so I, I'm trying to get more information. Maybe they are, they just haven't said it, but it, it, it always feels like people aren't satisfied with, with the ends and not the ends. So I'm just trying to get the information I need to serve the needs that you guys have. Yeah. I think the question really is, is the Vermont portrait of the graduate adequate for you to modify the ends or are you interested in doing a series of meetings involving the community to create um so they wouldn't be board meetings they'd be strategic like vision meetings to come up with a portion of a graduate that feels like it belongs in this place um and i've both done the work before with different districts and it's it's a series of meetings because you, it just doesn't get done in one city. Yeah, there's lots of groups of people you should connect with along the way, but it's fine. It is fine. The other other possibility, again, as a group, you have to decide if you're satisfied or not, is to take the ends the way that I've interpreted it one at a time as a subcommittee and say, are, is this what, when we created this, is this what the, the, the community intended? Because the community may have a different intent as well. Um, you know, is that flavor of the community intent in there and how this is interpreted? Those might be important discussions as well. Um, and again, I, I the, only, the only reason I keep, keep saying you, you folks as a board um, is because you're trying to envelop and under this idea of, of your engagement with if this would be one way to have you know good conversations with them and get some ideas generated. Right. Doesn't mean I can't do it during my open forums. Uh, but but again, that, that you're not going to get your Sorry if I made it more complicated. No, 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 no. I mean, the other thing to keep in mind is is um, the ends we currently have that have been interpreted and that have been accepted from year to year to year to year to year. Um, If we, it, what you're talking about when you say making a portrait of the graduate, that's basically the similar process that we went through to create these ends. Now, and when we've had folks take a look at our ends, they haven't really said, oh gosh, you should go out and redo your ends. But it's, I think what, and maybe Part of what we need to focus on as a board is looking at is bringing back to the community the interpretations and and the results and saying are we on the right track is this what you had in mind when I, you I, I think this is a I mean kind of like trying to like tiptoe into the pond here because I'm like do I want to jump in um I think this is a, a ripe opportunity to go out into our community and say, what do you what do you see for our students? Like, what do you like? Like, let's come up with this portrait of a graduate, and that is, I think, already going to bring in ownership on that end of the community if they're feeling like they're involved, rather than just being told like, oh, this is what we see sitting here, and this end, and this is what we think. Like, I mean, I just feel like there is a great opportunity to get that mm -hmm. feedback and to really like help kind of steer the direction that we see for the future of OSSD and mm -hmm. not kind of still just. It'll, it'll help inform 
your end discussions that will help inform my interpretations. Um, typically, the portrait of the graduate way back when it was developed 20 years ago, which is the first time I encountered it, um, it was used for the NEAS process for districts to create their mission statements. Um, I mean, your, your ends is a little bit more specific than a mission statement, but it's along the same lines. So maybe tonight we decide the process of doing that. Like, in my mind, I think like a survey to the whole public with these topics and then also meetings for like maybe two of them and then two more of them and two more of them with like a big whiteboard or something and you're just like writing down what people are shouting out and then we take that back or someone takes that back and compiles it into this category under learner agency, this is under global citizenship, and then we say, is learner agency actually the right heading? Is global citizenship the right heading? I mean, maybe there's more humanity and a human aspect and a local aspect that isn't so global, but more personal. I mean, I guess that is how I see the process going. Like we can sit here and talk circles about it, but if we don't bring in the greater community mm -hmm. then it really is just us philosophizing about what we want <laughs> right right yeah. well at our last meeting what we had talked about was if did we want to just go with this or did we want to kind of create a board portrait of a graduate to use as that basis to go out yeah. and judging from from how we've all sort of managed with this with the exception of Katja who looked at some other ones and grabbed something from them, the rest of us have sort of been like, this seems okay um, for the most part. Um, and I don't think we need to go out to the public saying, this is what we advocate, what do you think? I think we can say, here are some ideas. What do you think of those ideas? Do you have other ideas? <clears throat> Without mm -hmm. it coming off as this heavy handed, this is ours, what do you think? Mm -hmm. um, right. But make right. it more collaborative. Right. Or ask the question in a way that portrays an answer to learner agency without giving any answers. Like, I don't know how would how to do that. But does that make it? Is am I talking? Making well, sense and I like think that? that this can be like like you said, like the roadmap. Like this is something that people can have as they're sitting there, so they understand like what it is. So we can stay broad and it's not like you know I want Jimmy to know Spanish like that's you know like we need to stay we need to also help obviously them then understand that this is a this is kind of we're looking at it from the clouds um, but yeah I mean I I think that we just I think we set a date and do this who wants beginning. to do it with me beginning of September <laughs> the other, other piece is that um, you know as board engagement you can still you know, connect with the SP a facilitator out for those meetings. And then the board participates in the crowd with uh, um, and that, that's not a bad Who do you hire to do that? Yeah, if you connect with the, the Vermont School Board Association, they should be able to help, help identify a facilitator. Um, I mean, Linda can reach out to I can talk, talk to them. Yeah, I can, I can do that. That might yeah. be a good idea. Yeah, so when we did the ends, the, it was a similar, it was a similar process. So um, was that recent? Years ago? Uh, so 15. the ends were developed in like 2000. Well, this is saying 2016, but I also saw some other things that said like 2012. Yeah, usually so it's been a long, yeah. it's been a long while. Um, and when we did it before, so we reached out to we reached out to educators. So we had a professor from UVM, we had a professor from VTC, we had, um, we might have even had a professor from Norwich. We had, we reached out to employers and we got sort of the employer perspective. Um, we, uh, we had the staff, so teachers, um, giving us input we had parents giving us input we had you know general community members giving us input so i would imagine i i'm just wondering 
I mean, that's sort of the way that I see it is that it would be more than just parents oh, of, yeah. of no, students. Which is why a survey be, might be tricky. Like just right. logistically, we want to be able to tap into a community that isn't just one email list. The, the survey is, is good for, for two pieces. The survey is good to either prioritize uh, the ideas that came up, you know, which ones are more important than others if we can only do so many. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also um, after you've kind of crafted from all this input, you know, what your final end statement is or what your final mission is, that goes out to get the community to vote uh, to see if you actually have some. You know, if 85% or 90% come back and say, yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head, know we should be running forward with it 20 percent come back and say you hit the nail on the head the rest say 80 percent say no and then it's time to go back to take a look at things so. So, so then we create this portrait of a graduate and then you as the administrator take it to the next level of administrators and they take it to the teachers and then it well, trickles down like that we have to then translate it into ends policies and then you take and the then he and takes it and he does okay. that. The, the best process that, that, that I've seen um, for the translation is you just get the basic ideas from all the different groups right you get them listed out you get a good team we used a couple of, of English teachers because they know how to synthesize you know narrative information um, they were able to separate out all the ideas into the different buckets and put a category heading on them and then make a, a mission style or end style statement for those buckets. Um, and then what was nice is that all the ideas that folks had come up with that fell under those buckets are now, you know, acceptable means to achieve the end. And now we have a bit of clarity of what they meant, right? Um, I think that makes sense. That makes sense mm -hmm. to me. So in an effort to just kind of like keep our yeah. momentum going here and movement into other parts of the agenda tonight, right. it sounds like we are in agreement that we should move forward in some sort of collaboration with community and parents and all yes. those um, stakeholders. Um, should we form a subcommittee that's going to be doing the work of this? This is going to be work um, that I do feel probably is not best spent during our board meetings until we have a conclusive thing to bring back to the board. Um, I'm willing to be part of a subcommittee if there are others who are willing to work on this with me because this is gonna be a substantial project. If you want, if you want me as a resource, I'm happy. Um, so as long as the, the dates are in conflict. conflict. Um, so if you don't want me there because I can take things over by accident so you're ready to say no to. <laughs> well, I think we just need to, I need, I need, I need help with the process. Um, yeah. I'm willing to run with the process. I just need help with And may I share the it. work of developing a portrait of a graduate is deeply connected to equity. The idea of preparing all our children for success. And just up two days ago on August 9th, I became aware of a recently released um, uh, mini grant $5,000 specifically for school boards to participate in visioning around creating more equity in schools. And this would fall squarely in line with that. You know, having a series of meetings with multiple stakeholders saying, what do we want for all our children? What does success look like for all our children? Um, and ultimately adopting, you know, ends or policy that is aligned to this. So um, I did want to make you aware of this grant. I'd love, it's an easy application. I'd love to submit it. Let's I'm do it. Great. Yeah. Oh, we have to do yeah, it. That'd them. be great. Great. Yeah. And Katya, I'd love to share with you on the subcommittee. I think that's great, me. Heather. I made some copies just so you could see it. It's like a two page thing. If we can do things where we're offering <clears throat> food, if you feed them, they will come. I found yes. at a lot of events that right. I do. <laughs> exactly. So we can feed them. That's what we talked about. So I move. For us, do I have to make a motion for this for you? Uh, I would say if you're going to form right. a subcommittee, yeah. you have to do two things. Yep. Make the motion to form the subcommittee, and you have to define what the powers they have, what they're in charge of. Thank you. Um, so, so I move to create a subcommittee <laughs> to uh, mm -hmm. further 
whatever. In fact, I, I, you guys, I, you know my words don't work after six. Um, to further um, this work on a portrait of a graduate, uh, members of the subcommittee will be myself. Are you raising your hand? Scott, Kluat, Hannah. Uh, I'd be well, part of it. Okay. And so the four of us. Um, Can I get that Scott and Hannah? Hannah. Hannah. That subcommittee, what do we say then? That subcommittee has... Um, we'll, we'll reach out to find a facilitator to create the process of... And a, and a schedule or plan for creating portrait of graduate with the community. Community engagement. Yeah. That subcommittee is charged. Yeah, that subcommittee is charged with the... Um, so really that's almost like it's a subcommittee to create the ownership linkage plan for the year. <laughs> really. You will definitely get that. That will definitely come out. I second that. Katya's motion. <laughs> awesome. Chelsea, that she started I, about I got 25 it. minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what, yeah, it's, it's a tough one. But thank you for seconding us. Thanks for coming. We'll be back. All right. So. Uh, so all those in favor? Or, Aye. 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 So you passed unanimously. Megan, are you are you hearing all of this and are you on board? Yeah. Yeah, uh, this song sounds good. I am bye. <laughs> okay. So that covers really the next the next item that we were gonna talk about was to actually start working on the plan. Um, which we sort of have by by creating a yeah, subcommittee awesome. to start creating that plan. Um, so next up on the agenda is uh, getting our mandated state mm -hmm. training. This is one of the Excellent. Okay. Um, so typically at the start of every every school year, um, we go through this with, with all the faculty. I usually do a little training. Actually, Heather will be doing that this year with the, the new teachers that are in. Um, there is training that is required by the state to happen on a yearly basis to make sure that, that uh, all school districts, all staff are in compliance. Um, in past years, I had gone along with what um, Brent had done, which was he had a uh, kind of a survey quiz with some information in it as well, which was, was pretty good, but was very expensive. Um, but the, the board doesn't really need all that. But the primary thing that, that you need to be aware of is FERPA, right? um, Family, Family Education Privacy Act, um, and then probably mandated reporting. Um, that one's a little bit of unclear. I was, I was looking at the mandated reporting and going, well, should, should they or should they not? And so when I, I picked up the law, um, it basically said anybody who's contracted or receives pay from a school district is required. So it looks like they are. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about this. But as an aside, all adults, in my opinion, that you know, think that there's child abuse going on should report period in the end. So I think it's going to go over. Um, in the board's aspect, you know, the, the probably the most common place you might come across this is when you're talking with your constituents. Um, but mandated reporting uh, was Act 60 of July 2015. Um, and it just requires uh, the reporting of suspected child abuse um, and neglect. Um, if you reasonably suspect, doesn't mean you have to know for sure, but if, if there's an update that a reasonable human being would say, hey, I think there's something going on there, um, you need to report. And I always take the tact of, um, I'm always gonna report even if I'm not sure because they'll, they'll clear it out anyway. They'll, they'll tell me right after that, no, this isn't one you need to worry about, but at least I've done my due diligence um, on it. Easiest way to report um, for uh, the board members is either you can talk with one of us, but you can just Google Vermont Department um, for Children and Families. Um, and then, you know, reporting for child abuse will be right up there as one of the tabs. I find that the easiest thing to do is to download the reporting form. Um, that they're going to require you to, to submit and I feel <coughs> because it's got all the information on it that when you call them up to report it what you have to do as well that they're going to ask you about. Um, and so that way you've got all your thoughts clear, you've got everything down that you need. 
um, supposed to happen within 24 hours of receiving information that led you to believe the child abuse was going on. Um, so that, that's important. But again, um, if you're ever in a, in a situation like this and you're really not sure, um, because it's not something that most of you go through, um, just, just reach out to admin. Um, anyone else will help you with the process. A couple of things um, just to be aware of is that they will try to keep the name of the reporter confidential. Um, if it is something that ends up in court, um, you know, if a parent violated uh, the law um, and they need more information as part of the trial, yeah. Uh, just be careful of that because I see the end intakes that come through and your name is on it. Yeah, so and just they're, they're, not, they're not supposed to. Okay. But they do, yeah. so just heads up. But they're supposed to keep it confidential. If it goes to court, though, they may call you in and things are known. But even in the case of a, a court hearing, um, they are only supposed to reveal who you are if they believe that you will be safe. So just a, a couple of things that people and I'm actually going to put this up there for a second. I'm going to give you a moment to read the definitions of abuse and neglect. And we'll talk about it for a minute or two. And then answer any questions that you have. Lane, is it something that you can email to me? Because I can't see it. I apologize. Yeah, yeah, I got, uh, our, our texts are out, out um, on, on vacation, vacation, so I left the best. I will email it to you after. Thank you. We're going to talk about most of it anyway as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just something to be aware of. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to talk about most of it anyway as well. So good. I'm glad you brought that up and reminded me. Um, so basically, one of the things to be aware of is once a child ages out at age 18, um, matters of abuse become police matters um, at that point in time. And there are agencies that are out there um, that support adult abuse, especially elderly abuse. Um, in those cases, it's best to kind of Google Vermont Adult Protective Services, and you'll get the information that you need for, for that reporting. A um, couple of things to be aware of is that abuse is most often perpetrated by someone the child knows. It's usually a caretaker. Um, things to look for are injuries that are kind of unexplained or that don't match the story that the child is telling. Um, the big one, um, is sexual behavior or knowledge is inappropriate for the age of the child. Um, or in our cases, you know, sometimes what we'll see is inappropriate sexual behavior with other children, especially among the elementary students um, at times. Um, depression, self-harm, suicide attempts can be an indicator. Um, Trauma-based behaviors uh, can be a pretty good indicator too, what those look like is it's, um, it's typically a real overreaction to the situation. Um, either they get really angry, they get anxious, or you see the, the fight and flight behaviors kind of kick in. Um, you know, the situation is, is at this level, but their reaction is only up here. It's usually a, a pretty good indication. Um, and then, especially with the smaller students, it's, it's if they're always desperately seeking attention from other adults. Um, neglect uh, typically is poor personal cleanliness. You know, the, the kid hasn't been showered in, in three weeks, um, the clothes haven't been cleaned. Um, lack of medical attention uh, and follow up care. And then um, if they're stealing food, um, are these are pretty good indicators to report. So questions at all on mandated reporting? All right, so FERPA, this is the bigger one. Um, this has to do with protecting the privacy of student educational records, and there's two types of records. There's permanent records, and then there's temporary records. We actually touched on this a little bit um, uh, when people were asking, well, you know, who has access to you know, discipline reports and things like that. Um, permanent records are things like your grades, your SBAC scores, the ed testing that you go through. Temporary records are, are like your disciplinary records. Those get removed um, when the student graduates, usually within a year. Um, what most schools do is they literally put all those temporary records in a file, and when kids are coming in for graduation rehearsal, they hand the file to them. Um, if they're not picked up, some schools will send out a notification and say, hey, do you want them? Because if you don't want them um, and don't pick them up within the next 30 days, they're all going to be sure. To the student or to uh, the to offer the, to the parents? To the parent. Thank um, you. It gets a little bit quirky um, because the rights under FERPA transfer to the students at age 18. Yeah. And then if a parent of a student who's 18 comes in and wants information about the kids' grades and stuff, they can't give it to them unless the student's signed a release. So there's a lot of little parts and pieces uh, to that. 
Um, this only affects records that were collected uh, while a, a, a person was an actual student. So like we're collecting data on alumni and things like that, that's after the time of being a student here, that's not protected. Um, the other thing that it does not protect um, against um, is if I'm taking my personal notes during the investigation, uh, the sole holder of those notes, those are not protected. Mm -hmm. Uh, FERPA gives uh, parents and students uh, the right to inspect and review their educational records and the right to request corrections if they think there's an error. Uh, and so during that process, there's a couple of quirky things about the law. We're not required to make copies for them if they request it, um, unless they're like living in Texas and it would be you know, inconvenient for them to come in and inspect them first. Um, in that case, we could, but if we knew we were allowed to charge fees for the copies. Um, if a student is bringing up or a parent is bringing up, hey, I think the record is incorrect and we investigate it and, and we feel that it is correct, um, we do not have to change it, but then they would have the right to have a hearing. Um, and then at that point in time, if after the hearing is decided that the records remain unchanged, um, there's not too much that they can do except they can attach a statement to it. So they can write, yeah, I believe that this you know, record is an error because, and then we would attach that to um, the paperwork. And the hearing would be with us? That here? Yeah. yeah. You are the quasi judicial, you are the court of last resort. Yes. Um, which is <laughs> um, in terms of information that we can disclose without violating uh, FERPA, um, if the student's transferring to another school, uh, we're allowed to provide that information to them. If the student's applying for financial aid, we're allowed to provide that information to the financial aid folks. Um, school personnel with legitimate need to know. Um, so in other words, obviously, you know, IEP information should be kept confidential, but if you're a teacher and you're working with a student in the class, you have a legitimate need to know what the IEP is, otherwise you're not going to be able to see it. Um, happens with medical records as well. Um, if, if people have a legitimate need to know, you can share medical records. Um, if it does not apply uh, to teachers and staff, if it is between But it's really about protecting um, and the medical uh, provider. It's really about preventing the employer from giving information about medical background that they should have. Um, so a perfect example of this is that if I've got a student who's got a medical condition as a bee sting allergy, a coach would have a legitimate need to know. They get stuck out on the field and know what's going on there. Um, we can also provide this information to the authorities juvenile court system, um, especially if it's an emergency or if it's a matter of health and safety. Um, so it's kind of, again, it's that legitimate need to know the piece. And then directory information, as long as the district provided the parents with the ability to opt out, directory information is name, address, contact information. Um, so we, we do that every year. The schools actually set that out usually in their own way packets. So questions on the work Easy stuff. Yeah. And uh, Megan, I will uh, send you a copy of this with my notes. Yeah. Okay. As well as to the, the other board members. So no quiz. All right. Board <coughs> orientation. Um, and that we we uh, the group that do, does board orientation we not able to meet before this meeting um, I did print out what we've come up with so far yes we do have a plan um, of what we would like to cover in the orientation um, I guess but I'm wondering if we just yeah, table it table, table, table it to September we don't have it. our other new board member is also not present here tonight yeah and September will be more sort of the end of the summer. I so think I think it's hard to discussion summer. to our September meeting. Okay. Do we have yeah. a second? Second by Hannah. Oh. Any discussion? Oh, are you taking notes too? Uh, I am. Oh, because oh, Chelsea is. Sure oh, I wasn't sure if you were. I am. Yeah, I am. She is. <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, awesome. Any discussion about tabling the orientation to September when everybody's here? Okay. All those in favor, Copy. say aye. 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 Okay. It's passed. Who is that second by Hannah? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. So we're going to move along. Um, and this we may also want to. Um, Oh, did she do two? Yeah, she did two pages. So, um, oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, yes. So we were going to look at our annual agenda. This is um, kind of what Katya and I use when we go to um, create the agenda for the board meeting. Um, so you'll notice on the August 10th one, um, we've got, we sort of have the different tasks that the board is going to be working on. So we just received our mandated training. We're uh, create ownership linkage plan, uh, do the board orientation. So we've just moved that one over. Um, and then, um, so it goes month to month to month. And part of what um, you just want feedback on, I guess, is um, are there some things that you see that you would like to have on here that are not on here? Um, <laughs> One of the things that we talked about last time that we talked about really making sure that we um, kind of put this down to the skeletons of the, you know what I'm saying? Like we really mm -hmm. tried to flush out all of the stuff that we didn't need so that we can, we can build mm -hmm. on it when we feel like we need to or if there are things that we do need to end up adding to it. So I just wanted to check and kind of acknowledge that these are all the things that we're currently seeing on here are the things that we are kind of like required to mm -hmm. see by a board, as a board, based on our current processes. Mm -hmm. Is that my yeah, understanding Yeah, correctly? yeah, yeah. Um. Because I know last time we had talked also about potentially not for, um, transitioning to not reviewing policy like on, a, on an annual or do you know by annually on that one of the discussions uh, we decided to go annually because it's part of our it's the only thing that we review late on right was that what was, oh what where's, are you talking about the monitoring reports the ends or the el monitoring mm -hmm. Um, we decided to keep those within a year later. I, I put those, those yeah, things. because we had we had a discussion about yeah. it. We didn't make a decision about that. So I just kept them as as they have been. Um, and I think what came out of that was because that's what we're that's what Lane's annual Yes. Yes. So if you're the annual right to have it right. to review. Right. So they're they're here, and so you'll notice. And and when we when we start, it's review the first month, and then accept the second month. Review the first month, accept the second month. So I decided I added review and discuss the ends. I added that for October because Lane uses testing data, which tends to come out in October. And yeah, yeah, it's just in October, November, the state is always way behind. I'm worried this year that they may not be releasing state level data. They seem to be, I am not sure, they're keeping it close to the desk but based upon their activities. It looks like they may be changing from SBAC to some other unknown. Oh man, they're going to change the test again? Great. Yeah, it was, it's up for, they have to bid on it like we do um, for the, the vendor. Um, contracts come due, mm -hmm. and it looks like based upon some of the things that they're up to, that they're potentially going to shift to a different, I don't know what, so but that may blow the ends report partially out of the water. I won't be 
I'll be able to give you data, talk about progress, but I, I, a lot of this bases on how we are relative to the state average. So, right. Safe. Or to look over the long term on how a group is doing, and if they change the test, it changes. Yeah, my interpretations were on changes based on the state average. Yeah, so the, the ability to do that. But those may change as, like I said, the, the curriculum committees um, for each of the area of the foundational um, knowledge ends um, are up and running as of August 29th. Um, one of the things that they'll be doing is reviewing those interpretations may change. Mm -hmm. So, like, when I'm looking at things on here, like the SBA regional meeting in September, is that just like letting us know that the meeting is? Yeah. I, and I'm wondering, you know, like even like things like that, I feel like, do those have to be part of our agenda or is that just like a email letting? Well, that's our professional organization. That's our opportunity to meet with other boards and to learn what other boards are doing. I mean, we could continue to, you know, we you're, can you're a voting work member. in a va vacuum over well, here. Well, I'm not it's, saying we don't go. I'm just saying, like, does it have to be something that is on well, our agenda? To I think it's, well, it's, it's there just as a reminder oh, so people question. know. You also have we to can vote let. sometimes on who your voting members like to be off the board if one right. person is doing. So if I think we're going to have That's why, and the, at least you know, that's been my experience in the past. Okay. So, right, yeah. if not everybody goes, if there's only one person from OSSP who's going to show up and the board gives them the authority to vote on. So, I'm not sure I have the right paper. Can you? Can I see? Oh, maybe. Oh no, you don't. You have you have the old one. So the old one. This is the one. This is what you guys have been. This is what on. we've oh, been using. Fabulous. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And and we may, Linda, if she has a chance, she might change the. It's in a Google spreadsheet, which is really hard to manipulate. <laughs> It's got words in it, and spreadsheets are really for numbers, so it's it's kind of frustrating to have to work with this thing. So she may move it back into a Word document that'll make it a little bit easier to read and to kind of be aware of. But it's it's how we plan our work, and that's where you know the ownership linkage. I mean, a, a large part, and as we review uh, our governance policy 4.2, you'll see that. A large part of our work as a board sh should be doing that ownership linkage. So, you know, we have been kind of coming here and doing a meeting, but we might, once we sort of have a plan in place, our meeting may be that ownership linkage, and then we'll add a few things on there, but, but that'll be the bulk of our meeting. So you won't have two meetings a week, you'll or a month. Gosh, not a week. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, you have two meetings a month. You'll have one meeting a month, and we'll be doing the ownership linkage work, and then we'll just add in, you know, either at the very beginning some things or at the end, you know, because it it shouldn't the the bulk of our work should be. Our, so our ownership if we're gonna linkage, have, our board education, our reviewing of policy. So if we're going to have ownership linkage, and I agree, I think it would be great to have it more consistently, almost at every single meeting, like a dialogue about what our owners want from the board. And I, I mean, how do we fit that in? Your, your subcommittee meeting, the subcommittee that you just set up, that should be reporting out regularly to the board on what it's discovering and how what its progress is. And that's how the board is able to consider the ownership. Okay. So, the so it's not the public coming here and actually having they, they, the they, ownership they, linkage in this space. It's, it's it might be gumped. It might be saying, okay, our meeting for October, we're going to be doing our ownership linkage. And that will be the bulk of what we do. And then we'll add in, you know, I mean, a review of the EL report. We don't really, that's when we first get it. Elaine takes five minutes to say, hey, this is, 
this is the, the report that I'm sending out and then we have a month to sort of look at it and make sure do we understand his interpretation? Do we understand his rationale for it? Does his evidence seem okay? Do we feel like we need to go down and take a look at the evidence further? Um, that's what that is. So on like these months, we're, we're actually, we don't have a lot on our agenda. And that's been part of the whole purpose has been to sort of get some of this clutter out so we can actually spend our time doing the work of the board. So they're not creating like multiple meetings now that we need to go to in order to um, connect with the community. So we might, you know, have a board meeting where we're meeting with business leaders or a board meeting where we're- And the subcommittee will plan those specific yeah, the activities. Yeah, the subcommittee is gonna be looking at that linkage. How are we gonna do it? When are we gonna do it? And then we can, put it in here <laughs> and then so it, it might be that we that we warn that the meeting is not going to be at Braintree maybe it'll be so else. should we do it every meeting <laughs> like have a thing a little piece of it be at every meeting ownership linkage I kind of think since that's, that's the biggest problem that's the best way to address it and I definitely think that there are some ways that we can pull in like I'm thinking about you know I, I typically attend the um, community forums but I mean, a lot of times I'll be honest, like there's no other board member on there. Um, and I think that things like that that are already in existence that are happening, like that could be great ways for us to bring that information into this sphere. Like, oh, I attended the, the you know, community forum on this and there were only eight you know, community members present, but this was a discussion, like how does this fit into, on a broader, again, on the, in the clouds focus, but I think that there are things that are happening that we can also kind of do more. And yeah. You're triggering a memory, um, which is scary sometimes. Um, but what I've seen boards do in the past is just what I'm about to say is that um, there is kind of reporting out, it's usually close to the beginning of the meeting, and that's kind of the linkage piece to talk about what you experienced about the schools. Um, or things that you saw just to bring it up. Um, and it's really just, this is what we heard, this is what people seem to be concerned about. Um, this is what people said was going, going really well, it was awesome. Um, and typically that's where, if you have a student member on the board, that's what they speak up to. They talk about what's going on in the schools, what's going on, you know. And that's a reporting they do at every meeting, kind of reporting out. Um, not explaining it very well, but it was, uh, it was interesting to see that it was in the process. And that was one of the ways that they established that linkage because then it would entice people into the conversation. It would also, um, I think they actually even did it before community comment uh, because then the community could comment on those things. Yeah, I was there too. I had concerns about this or I really like that. Um, and that information we taken into account as the work plans future projections as well. There should be some really critical piece there. Again, you're not quite that type of Policy yeah, well, my concern with that is we're going to end up looking at, you know, hey, we don't we don't like how the 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 humanities curriculum is or we don't like how the lunch thing is. Yeah. And and we need to be looking at the outcomes piece and your forums are. Well, the principals are doing ones that are sort of, what are your concerns or issues? They're switching it up this year because they're doing a lot of policy changes around discipline and master schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, so they'll be having a lot of more directed conversations about right. the issue the community. Mine are gonna be much more focused now that COVID is over back on um, continuous improvement. These are the things that we're working on. It's kind of similar to what you're talking about. Right, right. so maybe some of yours we could we could link up with you if it's at the outcomes level, not how you're doing it, but this is what we're focusing on in terms of the outcome versus, because it's very easy for the board to get dragged into how you're doing it and, and what you're doing and and we're looking at the 
the outcome piece. But I think I think in like the reason, like obviously I attend the community forums because I'm a parent. But I think as a board member, it's so important to also be understanding like what's like those are my constituents who are attending those meetings too, mm -hmm. and like here, okay, this is the so I do, and I do just feel like it's kind of right for ownership linkage in that sense as well. Mm -hmm. Understanding what, and again, we don't have to look at the specifics of like, okay, we don't like pizza in the lunchroom, and there are things that we're not going to be applicable to how we address them here. But I think it can again just kind of help from that like be another level that our global yeah. perspective of like, okay, mm -hmm. this is the this is the common theme that we're hearing. How does this play into what we've just worked on with our with our portrait of a student? How does that play into our ends? Are we missing something? Like mm -hmm. that's gonna influence and in what we as a board are able to address or take on or or manage. And I, I was I, yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna say one more thing because I'm gonna forget it. Yeah. I've written it. Um one of the other things when I was like looking at this is that I'm wondering if there are things on here when we get our superintendent's report from Lane, which is helpful. We read it before the meeting. If there's any questions we have on it, we can ask them. Is there mm -hmm. a way on here, or are there things on here that potentially could be almost like board chair report? Like I'm gonna report that this month is the VSBA meeting. We should all be signing up if there are things. So it's almost like that document that we're able to read before the meeting. And if there's any questions on it, we can say, oh, Ann, do you know mm -hmm. who's going? Or or we need mm -hmm. to vote on this thing. But, but that, again, I'm just thinking of ways to like streamline things and make things bit more efficient in that sense of let's read through it and if I have questions I'll ask it's a good idea rather than mm -hmm. having a 20 minute conversation about where is it what time yeah. does it start what are they going to talk about okay so we yeah. there are things yeah. on here as a chair and I'm, I can work with you mm -hmm. at our next meeting of identifying okay this doesn't this needs to be somewhere in our meeting but maybe doesn't need to be actually like an agenda item it can be compacted mm -hmm. into this like bullet pointed it could just be in a report. Yeah. Um, things, upcoming things. Yeah, like a need to know. Yeah. So I mean, I think I'm. I think this annual agenda, as it's been kind of shrunken down a bit, I'm happy with it, and I think if we work to make it more efficient with things like like a chair report on things that we need to know about but maybe don't need to discuss, um, mm -hmm. I'm happier. Yeah, that would be that would be easy enough to do. And I like the idea of that collaboration with things that are already happening to help inform the conversation. The right. Awesome. So that would be communication. Well, and the super the principals reports, do they mention in I'm sure they're mentioning in the principals reports when they're having community forums or does that come out separate? They do it's little the announcements to their school communities and it's on their calendars that are on the website. Yeah. Um, the other place where um, I've seen board involvement for community engagement is one of the things that we're, we're working towards is getting the, the principals to re-engage in terms of having an advisory council and, and or a PTO, PTA. Mm -hmm. um, and those are places where really rich discussions that are specific to a school go on um, to get ideas from, from community members and whatnot. And typically in a lot of districts, um, a board member uh, will sit on that, not as a board member, as just a community member, as a parent to have input in terms of that can mm -hmm. important on them too. So I'm not trying to look at I'm just trying to get ideas. Um, okay. So they've got some engagement because they're going to be, be more about this year. Of course, that's not going to be are they looking to stand at the PTA this year, or is it just because they're because they're active? <laughs> I the the requirement that I'm, I'm laying on them is they at least need an advisory council. But if they would like to do a PTO PTA, lots of times, um, yes, they have a fundraising component typically, but they also serve as that that advisory um, piece. Uh, and so those are discussions we're, we're, we're entering into. It's great to create those groups because those fundraising activities just bring people together and like. Fun. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think it's about culture, and that's all the way to help people yes, that. Yes, for sure. And so it all comes back to the goal this year is, is engagement with community because that's what required. Foundation. <laughs> yep. So that's a It's gone. I'm. I have been interrupting all meetings, no, so I just am acknowledging and.
The thoughts are so fleeting. We just burst out with them and then they're gone. Thank you. So I move to approve the annual agenda as written with the added kind of topics that we just discussed and discussed and discussed and discussed, discussed, discussed about making right. Okay. I'll second that. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Okay. So, and I've got a little note on there for myself. Okay. So, moving on, um, we have just the review. So, again, this is just the first reading of Lane's um, monitoring reports on three policies. So, EL 2.0, 2.8 and 2.9. Um, so again, the board's job is to read through those, look at his interpretation, um, look at his rationale for his interpretation, and then look at the evidence and uh, decide is the interpretation reasonable and is the evidence sufficient. Um, so Lane, do you have any yeah, um, things you want to tell us about these? So just in general, um, EL 2.0, that the global executive constraint, really what that policy is designed to do is to make sure that um, the organization is acting legally, properly, appropriately, ethically. Um, and typically, in terms of my interpretation, um, I always look at an organization as it really is the people that make it up. Um, and so I am working with the staff to make sure they're informed on you know what proper compliance is, um, holding them accountable if they will not compliance. Uh, that's the basis for my interpretation. Two O, um, my report compliance. Um, Two point eight um, communication and support to the board. Um, that one is really designed just to make sure that I'm giving you the information that you need and helping through the budgetary process to make sure that you have the resources that you need to, to, to perform your functions. Um, my report compliance on the 2.8. Um, 2.9, this was actually a pickup um, that Ann had. It had not been on the annual agenda for time out of mind. And it was funny, I was trying to figure out how it was missed. I went and looked at the policy manual. It's not in the table of contents. It's actually in the, in the thick of it. Right, but, but, it's it, not. but it's not in there. So this, um, it, it really is making sure that I, I'm informing you um, about when there are, are policy changes, you know, federal policies and things, kind of a lot of work that you've been doing lately. Um, luckily, it was covered under two other of the ELs anyway. Um, there were two other executive obligations and interventions that had required this as well. So is this redundant? I know, um, should we get rid of it? <laughs> no, I think it, you know what, I think it is good. It, you know, the, the discussion I had about the, the EL piece wasn't that I, I don't mind doing them, just making sure that they're valuable. Um, but it is good, the, the yearly piece, um, because that's when we all sit down and look through it again and remind ourselves of what we're supposed to be doing. You know, we do look it up when we need to, if there's a question and whatnot, and, you know, we have a general knowledge of it, but you can't keep detailed information on 68 different provisions of, you know, 15 different policies or 10 or however many there are. And a few of them, don't they have to have certain personnel listed on them? And so if you don't update it at the beginning of the year, yeah. all of a sudden yeah, you don't policies. have the right. We just, we just went through that. With right, the you don't have the right person there, and then you're like, oh, yeah. shoot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, those are different. so those are those are the federal ones. So I'm just I'm just going to run back to this one quickly, just to clarify with 2.9, because you yeah. said it, 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 you know, we kind of overlooked because it wasn't on the table of contents, but you said it was addressed in other EL policies. So is yeah. there anything specific to this policy that you feel other EL policies do not directly address? No. Um, so then my question is. So your global constraint policy covers it anyway, right? We've got to act legally and ethically. So we have to follow all these policies that come out, otherwise we're not having to do that. And you would be able to use your rationale to support. Oh yeah, and you, you know real quick if you weren't following but that's what I'm, why I'm asking yeah. when you're talking about like the efficiency of your EL policies and yeah. writing your reports. If this is reported on in other EL policies, do you feel that it is essential that we have let me, a separate one? Let me do some more thinking okay. about it and looking at it and 
a variety of different ways before I, I give you my, my thoughts. Sure. Uh, just to be the green light to get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, no, if, 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 if that were going to be a decision, then let's make sure it's the right one. Yeah, exactly. No, no, I definitely agree. So but I, I'm just no, I appreciate thinking about brought up, we're talking about it. If you're, I don't want you to have to write an additional honor report if you're already reviewing all of these specific items yeah. under other monitor reports. That seems redundant. I did have, I just was curious, do we ever get gifts? That was my, do we ever get uh, We there? do, they don't typically hit a thousand. Um, the place where we see it the most is um, the radio program. Oh. Um, people, they'll have a, a beat up car that's been sitting in the, in the farm field for a hundred years, you know, rotting. They'll bring it in the kids and they'll fix it up nicely. Um, and so, you know, most of those, because of the condition, they're not in a thousand, but we do get, uh, we do get donations. They just got an ancient, uh, it's not actually not ancient, it's just, it's, it's worn out, they're gonna do a lot more kind of speed on. So it's kind of like that. Do they ever do anything like that? Um, what is that good, what's that car program at Burlington? Um, right, the, the, where are they, where are they? Good neighbor. Good news, yeah. garage. Good news, garage. 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 Do they do anything like that where the neighbor pairs the cars and then they're donated out to um, typically what they do is they sell them. Um, and, and, uh, they usually them use it for scholarship money or yeah. something okay. for the kids in the town. I was just thinking because in my line of work, I know there's a lot of people that need transportation in this yeah. community. They, so. they also do mm -hmm. a lot of uh, a pro bono okay, work um, if, uh, you know, elderly folks in the community who may not have a lot of funding if the car is broken down and uh, the lawnmower's not working, you know, they'll go out because it's good experience to do. Um, the last piece here was uh, was 2.7. That was from um, probably a couple of months ago. I had just brought up at the time the, the concern that it was leaving in the hands of the superintendent um, the ability to change, uh, you know, retirement benefits, mm -hmm. those things. Um, there is a good argument to be made that it is kind of covered under the comparables piece. And I, I got to be comparable. The thing with retirement benefits, especially for non-union folks, is it's pretty variable across the state. Um, so I did check in with Pietro, he came back, he said, yeah, that seems to be a lot of power to be vested in one person. Um, so what I did so that the, the policy didn't need to be changed is in this uh, final kind of draft that I've given you, I changed my interpretation um, to basically say, yeah, um, it won't happen unless I inform the board. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, that's got, got, got at least the concern that I had. So that policy, that uh, monitoring report, we actually have to take a vote as to do we accept that interpretation? I move uh, to accept change? the interpretation of 2.7 compensation and benefits as submitted. Okay, do we Seconded. have a second? Seconded by Hannah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So it passes. Okay. Um, and then uh, the monthly financial reports were sent out separately. Lane, do you? So I, I had sent, are, uh, I sent an email to the uh, anomaly right that we here. picked up during the accounting same. process. Mm -hmm. and that has been corrected. It's um, uh, in terms of, of course, that will uh, be on. Hold on, this is not on our agenda. Right. Oh. But that will yeah. be down in, in your closing, usually. It's not. Yeah. We'll wait till we get We'll wait. Okay. Um, Sorry. Nope. And then superintendent evaluation. Um, so I created a form and then I forgot to. Um, can I? I wonder if I can email it to you, Lane, and you can project it. Um, so if we want, we could take a little five minute restroom break, if folks want stand up break while I email this over to Lane and he can just project it. It's basically just the form um, showing our evaluation. Which is odd looking because it's policy covered at the same time. Five minute break? Five minute break. Okay, so, um, as you know, in our policies, um, 
you look at the policy for evaluating the superintendent, um, we do that by looking at the EL reports and the ENDS. Um, so if you look at monitoring the superintendent performance, systematic and rigorous monitoring of student a superintendent job performance will be solely against the expected superintendent job outputs, organizational accomplishment of board policies on ends and organizational operational operation within the boundaries established in board policies on executive limitations. So basically um, what we have on our, and this will um, be in a file, we'll keep it in a file um, in the central office, but this is basically a review of this past year. So we had an ENDS report last October um, and we accepted that report, as you can see from all the yeses. And then um, the EL monitoring reports, we accepted all of them, except if you go down, you'll notice that 2.7, we don't have a date there yet. Um, that will get filled in. And then on this next page, um, there is a sign off. Um, so, but before I sign off on it, are we all um, in agreement that we have accepted all of the monitoring reports yeah. and the ENDS report? We also, I put in there also that we had our um, external report from the auditor. We accepted the letter from the auditor and the report from the auditor. So I use that also as, um, Part of the evaluation that um, he is in compliance with uh, the accounting for the finances of the district. So do I have a motion to or any questions about the evaluation? Oh. Uh, so do I have a motion to accept the evaluation? I don't know. Do we need to do that? Um, or do we just need we do, to have it? accepted all those. Um, right. I, so. just, I do have a question, though, um, kind of a, just a general question. Is this the only, is, is accepting monitoring reports the only way that a policy governance board can conduct an evaluation or like are there other I'm just wondering if there's like I'm just wondering yes. if there's other processes yes. this is that the would only, maybe um, unless we added something in here if you wanted to add something in here but basically if you're following the policy governance model what you're doing is you're using those ends to push the system and you're using the executive limitations to give him the guidelines for where he, right. And, and that's how you're evaluating whether or not you're getting what you want from the system. So again, it's the, the ends piece is really the driver and we haven't, we haven't spent a lot of time on our ends. We, I mean, we're starting to, but we haven't, we've gotten reports and we've accepted them. Um, but I think, and I'm not only, I'm only bringing this up because I feel like there's been some discussion about, um, and I guess this can get addressed with, as we do, as we work through our ends and stuff, but, um, I also want to acknowledge if this is the most beneficial way for us to provide feedback or you to provide feedback on how that. I think the. Under the policy governance, the feedback would happen during the discussion of the reports, reports okay. which isn't a bad thing because it, then it's ongoing and you can adjust to it in real time, you know, as opposed to, you know, finding out at the end of the year that, hey, we've right. you done this or mm -hmm. not. But I, I think it might be, you know, that beneficial, especially the ends conversations. Uh, that's where the clarity is to just have a conversation about those reports. Hey, I don't understand this or we're not in agreement with this. You need to. Or we'd like to see you and we agree as a board that this should change or mm -hmm. yeah. And 
those would be valuable and helpful uh, in those types of conversations. Uh, but I, my understanding is that those conversations would happen during the and I think we talked about last time too how that yes we have our we have our like calendar of ends but if there's ever any time that we feel like oh we'd like to have this reviewed and have this report we don't have to wait until like oh it's right. not happening until next <coughs> May like we can say we'd like you to run a report even if we just had it run yeah. okay yeah. yeah especially if it's not, something's not right or I'm not being straight up about something you're certain mm -hmm. I'm not implying that you are. I'm just saying no, we no, have no, we no. we have the ability to use that process in a way that we feel might be of value, unless you know if we feel the need for having it. Yeah. Right, and that's where too. I mean, if you have a concern, we need to look at our policy and you know see where that concern falls, and if there's a specific concern it may be just like again those those the policies are they start fairly broad and then they get more specific as you as you go through but remember that if you tie his hands too much then he doesn't have the 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 freedom to sort of manage in the way that that he feels is going to is going to work as long as it's ethical prudent and and legal so you know, it depends on how much you want to dig down into um, and specify exactly, I want you to do it this way. I mean, because then we would be holding him accountable to that. I mean, he would have to show that he's doing it exactly the way that we want him to. Uh, these are still rather vague. Um, they're specific and yet they're vague. I did, I did did a bit of work on the interpretations of the last couple of years to try to get a pretty pretty concise. Um, mm -hmm. But you know that's a part of the board discussion. But that that interpretation doesn't match, you know, your intent. That's when you put that extra layer of policy. Right. I think one of the things that may and I may be alone in this thinking um, m may be helpful is I I mean I understand this is a this is a look back. Um, I find it helpful sometimes to be able to say like what's what's the look forward like and that I know I mentioned this in our agenda planning meeting of seeing if there's the potential of like that self evaluation of like these are the goals I'm setting up for this year like I love I, I enjoyed hearing how you were saying you know now that COVID's over with your with your community forums like your goal for the community forums is this I feel like having some of that knowledge as we work on your um, work on, I don't want to say your work on the superintendent evaluation is helpful for the board because I think also that that holds some accountability of us to say mid through the mid, midway through the year, you know, one of your goals was community engagement on these these issues have and I don't know if that's, you know, that can I understand that can come in your EL policy as well and the look back i'm just talking in circles no it's helpful you're, you're, to have a conversation about but i, I always appreciate like because i think i always think about it's helpful to look back but as the individual it's helpful to look forward and say okay this is what i accomplished this year yeah. these are the goals that i'd like to have in place for next year now you know what they are help me stay accountable you know what i'm saying like that i think yeah. that there is some value in that as well and i don't know how to bring this into <laughs> The discussion of the EL report since we're always looking backwards. We're always looking backwards on those. Well, the ends, and again, I, I think you have to adjust your policy. The, the ends are what I'm working towards. Those are my goals. But you're, you're digging a little deeper. The, one of the ways that I'm attempting to achieve those goals is to increase you know, student engagement um, mm -hmm. and staff engagement. So um, you could look at his strategic plan. I'm sure he'd share it with you. I mean, we could look you, at it. You already it. had it. You, you got my CIP. You know, uh, I don't know. It was on an agenda, maybe a meeting or two ago. Because again, we're up here. We're looking at if he's if he's achieving his goals, he's meeting our ends. So what you're looking at and is he's, and he's is moving the district I, forward. The, goal, the goals are the means I'm using. Yeah, to get to, to achieve the end. Yeah. Which yeah, which is fine. I mean, we got a lot of stuff. We got a lot of stuff going. That was a long strategic planning session. We, we had all this stuff that we wanted to, to be working on folks with like we got through about half of the and so we'll be continuing those conversations with the capital person here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think part of it is just it's a foreign 
Right. This is foreign to most processes that people are familiar with, including myself. So, yeah. I'm still thinking. Sorry. Well, I'm okay. happy to again change the policy. Change the policy. Yeah. I just want to make sure that this is beneficial for you as well as understanding. And I guess this is just the, the, the circle of conversation that I'm talking myself into right now because obviously it all has to do with our ends and our the, mo the monitoring. Of the conversations when the reports come up. That yeah. yeah. So like next month, I mean, it's, so it says accepted by the board 9-2, 9-2, 11-4, 11-4. Mm -hmm. So those are the months when we accept, accept them. them. Right. Okay. Right. And he has an ENDS report coming up. For the treatment of students, parents, gu guardians, community. That's the next one. And treatment of staff. No, like, that's last year. These are the ones we already accepted. Right. But they, they're, they they're coming at the same time. So yeah, next, so they're coming, yeah, they're on they'll be October. Be second, three, uh, okay. these, and then the month after, that will be the next right. set of emails. And that's when we would have discussion about that specific end. Yeah. And it's always a look back. Yeah. So is that how did but it go for the last year? It's a look forward if if you find a deficiency or then my job is to state this is what we're gonna do and this to is what I think will be in compliance, so that's the look forward. Right. Or if if we ha he has a reasonable interpretation, but we're like, ah, That's shoot, not what we meant. that isn't really what we meant. We can then adjust and review the policy and make changes to the policy to say in that first reading. It no, when after we've accepted the report, because we if we haven't said specifically, then and it's a reasonable interpretation, we right. can't suddenly okay. change yeah. the rules and say, wait, yeah. no, you were supposed to do this. We can say that's not what we meant, but for next time. We for, like so that's better. why last year we started this idea of let's, let's go through the monitoring and then after we've accepted it, let's then review that those particular policies and make sure we're still on board with them but the board wasn't feeling comfortable enough with using the policies to feel like they could, that, that we could yeah. do that, that we could adjust the policy. So perhaps this year we're feeling more ready to do that. And, and I think another way to think about it is what is your concern? And to think about what's the concern and what policies do we have that would might address that concern, and then look more specifically what specific thing within the policy addresses that concern. And then when you go to to look at the interpretation, it the interpretation and the rationale could be reasonable, but the evidence you could say, well, wait a minute. You said this was your interpretation, but okay. it's not reasonable or yeah. whatever, or it doesn't seem to fit. And we can we can have a conversation with him about the interpretation. We could say eh, that doesn't seem very reasonable. Or we could say that evidence that you're showing that you've met that interpretation doesn't fit or explain how that evidence shows that you're in compliance because it's not it's not fitting the interpretation that you've put forth. Or if my interpretation is reasonable, but again, it's not what we want. We want, then we've want, got to adjust the policy. Then you just adjust the policy so that the interpretation. All right, so we could squeeze it down a little bit further. Um, and then, and we do have an ENDS report coming up. So again, that's another time for us to look at how ENDS are being interpreted. And it sounds like, and maybe part of what we need to look at is for the first time in my experience of being on the board, we have a superintendent and assistant superintendent who are actually taking the ENDS and driving them down to the staff level and getting folks to sort of flesh them out from the professional standpoint. So we may over time get a more, um, a more nuanced ends report that says, that gives some benchmarks because remember part of what, one of our discussions we had earlier, 
can't remember which board mem meeting was it's awfully hard to and it's a little unnerving to feel like we're holding the the system accountable when the ends report is really focused a lot only on what happens once a student is a senior you know and to have an idea of you know are there checks along the way you know at yeah. the end of third grade at the end of sixth grade well and we just talked and, about how the portrait of the student's going to help right and, right and, help us and flush out a and more it's, it's a backwards substantial ends process report. For right us. if you tell us what you want for graduate it's our job to figure out how through the 12 right. years to get them there so in terms of like goals you know the the one two three four five six seven eight nine ten files that are up here this is the totality of the program that's designed to meet all the foundational ends, um, get them all up and running and get them moving in the right direction this year. Mm -hmm. um, so this is what the, it's a seven stage process that the, um, the curriculum team is working on in their separate programs, you know, like foundational knowledge for social studies, for fine arts, for, for um, right. life skills. And so, so, and that way I will just, I'll just add one other thing and that's where I think as a board, we need to be a little bit cautious about, you know, he started this work and then if we suddenly then sort of change those ends around, that means he starts all over again. Like a curriculum work never lose value. No, that has to be right. done regardless of. Yeah. So okay. one of the things so. I did in interpreting the ends was trying to stick to stuff that has to be done regardless of. So even okay. if you change stuff, I'm still going to have to do this work, but I'll have to do. OK, yeah, good, good, it. good. That was one of the goals. Excellent, excellent. Because I know in the past that's been part of the issue is, wait a minute, you go around changing, you change those ends up to specifically, then you're going to have to that go back to the drawing the board. Us being able to. No, right, yeah, I mean, exactly. We've all just came, come to the conclusion that those ends need to be reevaluated anyway because of the longevity of which they've been standing in place. So. Right. Right. Okay. Um, so moving on, uh, we have uh, the assessment of our governance policy. So this is when we ourselves, rather than doing the meeting evaluation, we are doing the um, reviews of our our policies, the policies that are that are governing the way we behave and what we do. So this particular policy um, was 4.2. So it's basically outlining. And again, it sort of falls in line well with the idea that we are going to do some orientation um, at the next meeting because this really outlines for a new board member what your job is. So um, and it's Again, although it's it's broad, it's also fairly specific as well. Um, so, uh, how would the board like to do? We've all had hopefully had a chance to read through um, and sort of assess how we're doing on the different uh, aspects of the of the policy. Um, and then looking at examples of that sort of thing. Um, did anything stand out for people in terms of we could move um, all the way to which areas were rated as some of the time, rarely or never, um, and look through it that way rather than going through yeah. each section? Mm -hmm. um, I think that would maybe make the most sense. So. Um, do we have a volunteer to go first? The only thing, I will go first. The only thing that I saw that was not happening was seeking input regarding owner values on issues of ends and ethics, which is what we've been talking about all night. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Thank like God, it's just, but that was it. I, yeah, I agree. I said that was, I mean, I said that whole number one wasn't happening. I said it has some of the time. Um, and I also said some of the time was create and maintain written governing policies because I said refocus on the ends to be more um, specific, i.e. we're reviewing portrait of a graduate to help inform our ends. Which number would that? So one and two, I felt like two. we were doing some of the time. I also with four, but why did I say that? 
four? Yeah. I said some, oh, four, I said always, um, because we have directed owners uh, to complaint procedure several times. Oh, we're, we're on number one? Number one, four, isn't that what oh, we're one, about? Oh, one, four. I don't have one, four on here. <clears throat> I have one, three. Oh, four is on my page. Sorry. Never mind. Yeah. So, and then. That's our policy. That's like yeah, our I procedure. Yeah, I said yes to that. I didn't want yeah, to accept yeah, the Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's our procedure for people who have. No, I said yes. No. We, we do that. This is, I was telling you. Like, yep. Um, I we did not feel that we. Problem. Um. I don't feel we're, we're not doing any reporting, so one, three on the organizational performance because we're not having those community. Right, I, mm -hmm. the only one, Other I said some, I said yeah, annual report to voters, yeah. <laughs> which is really pretty pathetic. Um, so I put, that's why I put some there. And then I put educating owners on issues impacting the organization. I put some because we did that whole flag policy discussion and that was sort of an issue that I mean, it didn't originate from us, but it came from Lane asking us to help the district create a policy due to the, the stuff that's been going on. So I, I said some there for that, but um, I said never for um, number one. So then I think the next question is at that last page, right? Mm -hmm. Right. For select one area for improvement, I said ownership linkage. Me sure. too. Me too. <laughs> yeah, so. Okay. Uh, what actions will we commit to take in the next year to improve our application of this policy? I said defining ownership linkage and the steps that we'll take to get to that place. So surveys, open forums, etc. And will it be accountable by forming a subcommittee, which we did? and we'll reassess mid-year. So and I said, I said creating an ownership linkage plan, actually linking with ownership, because it seems like we've been talking about it for a long time, but we just don't actually do it. What if we assessed it at every meeting <laughs> instead of assessing it halfway through the year? Like, I feel like it mm -hmm. should be talked about. Well, again, meeting. we could, because we've got ownership linkage on our agenda, it's a category in our agenda itself, we're going to have to, we will have check in on for the ownership linkage for the plan. Yeah, future. yeah. So we will be in a way holding ourselves accountable <coughs> um, in that sense. And then hopefully we will reassess again in August of 2023 when we create our next ownership linkage plan. And I think all board members need to need to make sure this is happening. I feel like we all need like a to, living thing, yeah. Yeah, yes. we need to keep ourselves Not a accountable. Okay. Um, was there any, there was one thing on here that I, what was it? Oh, that I wanted clarification. I don't, be familiar with all required policies in effect. To me, that was unclear. What does that mean? How did you guys interpret it? I was like, does that mean all required policies, meaning all of our, uh, all of our policies or all of the policies of the district because remember that's a little bit different i read it as ours you read it as our mm -hmm. policies so i think it's our policies too would people be willing to have it uh are they called governance yeah, policies, governance policies. Mm -hmm. yeah would just for changed, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if we want to amend that to board governance policies in effect. Does, are people in agreement with that? No objection. Just to be clear about what that means. 
Uh, so we probably need to vote that as a as a change to policy. Or will we well, call that first that's reading? That's a first reading. First and reading. Needs to be a second okay, reading so I will make sure that gets on the agenda for the next time. What is it wanting to read now? So I, I changed it to be familiar with all required board governance policies in effect. And we'll put that for a second reading and acceptance uh, at the next meeting. Okay. All right, moving on. Uh, we do have a new um, policy. So this is one of the ones that Lane keeps track of in terms <coughs> of policies that we have to have in place in the district um, to be in compliance. So yeah. Lane, you wanna well, take it away? Well, this policy update, um, we're gonna get a lot of money from the federal government for the school lunch program. Um, so they have a lot of things that they like us to do. Um, this is actually a fairly minor change. Um, we're met the wellness team um, is supposed to be four times a year. Who is the wellness team? And so that's that's pretty much the only change there. Um, it's important. It's a required change. Um, and guarantees that we continue to get federal funding for not compliance. How many was required before? I don't remember. I think oh, it was Karen. Karen uh, recently. Who, who is the wellness team? Uh, Karen Russo is the wellness team. Is that only related to nutrition education, the wellness team, or is that related to all of the... It connects a little bit on PE, on health curriculum, because there are components that are required under the policy to be in those. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, moving on to the consent agenda. Uh, in there, we have our board meeting notes from the last two meetings, and we have the professional contracts um, that have been issued since the last board meeting. Um, and these, remember at the beginning or the end of last year, we gave Lane permission, authority to just keep moving forward and hiring. Mm -hmm. um, and so, how are we doing? Are we? Better shape than most districts. Uh, a lot of districts had about a 40% turnover. That seemed to be about the average. Uh, they did a survey with the uh, Superintendents Association of where every district that um, our turnover rate was about 17 nice. percent um, we have i think we have one more outstanding special educator um, that i remember because we did fill we had three that were open the last time we had a board meeting that were like uh, you know regular education teachers teachers that weren't um, being paid for under federal grants um, and i think we filled two of them if i remember correctly great so we've got one that's still outstanding awesome so the um when on what is the school spring or school yeah we've expanded beyond that um especially if we haven't had any nibbles yeah uh, we use the the paper that's associated with the rutland area we use mm -hmm. the valley news we use the local we even um, go up to, to burlington road as well it gets expensive though are those all the currently open positions though on school spring or there are there are a number there that are above and beyond. Like I see, you separate them out into regular. This is these are the, the, the staff kind of members the core, that, yeah. that we normally use just to run our normal operations. So you know, like I said last time we talked, we were down three. Um, I think we're down to one now. Uh, there are others there that are title funded that are above and beyond mm -hmm. that we're trying to use to meet some of the um, recovery planning mm -hmm. uh, pieces that we put in place to recover from COVID. Uh, so so there are a number of those, but I'm just glad we got our mm -hmm. regular contract. Yeah. That okay. makes sense. 
Okay, so, so do we move to approve the move? consent agenda as submitted and congrats on the health um, nurses grant. Well done. That's fantastic. What will that be used for? To develop leadership in our nurses to provide them with um, additional access to professional development and um, to help them to develop supervision and evaluation tools to ensure that we have excellent nursing across our schools and because a lot of times nurses are evaluated on a teacher's rubric with the same benchmarks and it's not really effective in promoting their practice and so they'll get to do that work um, of developing that with a team in state so it's going to be yeah. really nice that they're a part of that um just quickly, what is the time spent like at Brookfield School of School Nurses? Like, are they here ever? Yes, um, they, you have 2.5 days of nursing here, and that's Brook Naylor, and 2.5 days she works at Braintree. Oh. And that's the same person, so it's a shared person. Yep. And then we fill in um, with uh, a CPR certified administrative assistant, unfortunately. But it's, 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 Do you ever have the school-based clinician in these loca in these outlier one locations? One day per month. Yes, we do. One day per month. One day per month, and once per year, a dental clinic. Health Hub, yeah. Health Hub comes directly here. Um, the dental clinic is run at Randolph, and we provide busing, busing for the so. students down. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, at least we, that's what we did. Yep. Yeah. yeah. No, that's happened for a couple of years. I when I got my first or second year here, we started that because we didn't put the electrical. Are you finding students and families are taking advantage of that program? Um, the dental program less so than um, there's extensive use of our nurse, mm -hmm. without a doubt, and um, significant of the position. Okay. But I would like to promote the opportunity of the dental more. Let's it was that. accessed, but um, I, I, I got the sense, I don't know, I got the sense that there were more students who needed it than accessed. We'll be in touch. <laughs> All right, so I move that. Okay, do we have a second for moving the uh, consent agenda second. as a whole? Yes. By Hannah. All those in favor say aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Okay, so the consent agenda is passed. Um, so we're down to um, superintendent's <laughs> report, um, and you have financials that. Um, they they came in late. These are from the end of June, so right? This, yeah, and the so, reason being is that it's the end of the financial year, so there's a huge closeout process. Mm -hmm. um, so it was good to pick out this stuff. Um, I'm trying to punch it. Probably the most important things here. Like I said, I had sent an email out earlier um, just to keep the board in the loop if there was an issue that came up when we're doing our checking and it has been resolved. Um, so we are in compliance. Um, mm -hmm. If you go to, let's see what page here, which is page number nine. So it starts off Orange Southwest 2021 summary, that's the revenue information. Uh, you'll see the next page over is expenditures. On the back of the expenditure page, mm -hmm. down at the bottom on the right, 2.396112. Mm -hmm. so that is likely going to be our surplus once it is confirmed by the auditors uh, this month. Right. Um, so again, what I've been doing, you know, as, as folks are in the loop, is I typically have been putting a chunk of it into our reserve funds for anticipated needs, and then the remainder um, is usually doled out over a three-year period to subsidize taxes. Right? So it's, you know, if I'm saving a million to put into taxes each year, that's taxes that people don't have to pay because technically they've already paid, paid it. That's why we have the surplus. If you flip over to the very last page to the technical center, um, you will see that they have a $688,000 surplus. Again, that's the, the numbers, you know, Robin has generated. Um, they have to be confirmed by the auditor. Right. So what will you do with all that money? So typically as we go through the budget process, um, probably best we can kind of look at last year. Um, 
we had to, I think, I don't remember what it was, maybe it was 1.6 million last year. Um, actually, it was about two. We took a million of it and put it into the reserve funds. Um, so the reserve funds, the money sits there. Uh, people voted in, it's for an intended purpose. Um, a good chunk of that was in anticipation of the PCB testing that is gonna happen this year. We have two schools that likely, um, because of their age, you know, may have hits. One of them is the one we're sitting in now, and the other is the RUHS or TCC complex. And so that was an anticipation of potential remediation that would have to happen. There was, if I remember correctly, a quarter of a million that was put in the operational reserve fund, um, and that's supporting some upgrades that we were doing across the, the district to digitize our workflows. Um, we have to revamp the financial software that was in the superintendent's report, that discussion about that. Yeah. But one of the nice things about the software package is that uh, it gets us away from a paper workflow. Everything will be digital. There is inherent liability in keeping student records for into perpetuity, which is required under the, the state, um, and human resources records, you know, for seven years down in that basement where they can get destroyed or any vendor that comes through, even though they're fairly secure, you know, who's working in that basement might have access to them. Uh, so it's, it's an upgrade there. Plus, it will just make the front office more efficient. There was money as part of that that was put aside to redo the district website, um, which is in the works right now. Um, this year we will be maintaining the old website while the new one is built. And then once we're sure everything is up and running, we will transition over. Um, there was another chunk of money in there I forgot, forgot off the top of my head. Does any of this money ever go back into like curriculum and teachers and supplies and uh, programming? We, we and... have what we need in the regular budget. So that we had the million for the, those long-term projects. Um, then we took a million of it, split it up over the next three years to subsidize people's taxes. Um, to try to make sure that you know they're, you know, we're helping people out. And raise and raise the budget to to put money into the programs or no? We've been doing that through the regular budget, so it's sustainable. Um, you know whether or not we always seem to have a surplus, but whether or not we have one, money. I'm wondering if there's. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. Yeah. Sorry about that. This is kind of I think this would tie into some of what you're talking about to Chelsea. If there's like, and I know we have like these little pots of money that we put some of the surplus into. If there's a pot that we could we could either think about doing like like an enrichment fund, kind of where where there is some money just earmarked for like, you know, um, if there's you know I don't even know if you could do like teachers could apply for mini grants for things that may not be that may be outside of kind of the normal, but we have a pot that we can then say, you know, yes, this fund, you know this teacher applied for a, a mini grant out of the enrichment fund for, you know, subsidizing an additional field trip that wasn't on the books. You know what I'm saying? Like things like so that. So there's, there's an operational fund uh, that we developed uh, a, two years ago that has the ability that could support that. Um, but typically that function that you're talking about um, comes about through the operation of the PTO or PTA, right? They are usually a fundraising organization as well as their advisory capacity. Um, and then the money that they put aside, in my experience, the, the ones that I've worked with over, over the last 20 years, um, they will set aside some money so the teachers can apply for those little mini grants to do something special in the classroom and some other you know, Remember, my focus in terms of building the budget is making sure that I'm achieving the ends. Mm -hmm. And so by changing the ends last year when we put in the arts and other things, like that in the, your list, and it's yeah, you've list. never had a you've never had a, an art person cut in this district. Um, you've never so yeah. And there, I also created a, a K to twelve professional development um, line in the budget about two or three years ago in anticipation of eventually having an assistant superintendent. Um, there's 106 thousand that goes in there every year, and that is used for the purpose of supporting the academic. So how the, the budgeting process typically should work, and that's one of the things that, that <laughs> list of um, thing, uh, documents that we're working on for the curriculum, the stages that we're working through, how it should work is we are charging the teachers with, with creating a, a specific level of performance from the kids in specific areas. If the teachers are falling short, that it's their job through the budget process and through the process that's being set up to be able to communicate back to us, this is where we're falling short. 
these are the reasons why um, this is what we need um, to, to, to mitigate those problems. And then we use the money that's in that K to 12 PD line to support that work. We ask for more if we need it, but that, I built that line specifically because I'm pretty good at strategically figuring out what we need. Uh, we may need more at some point, uh, but it is there for, for the use. So I don't, still don't know if I'm answering the specific question you have. Yeah, the rest of my questions are like, how do we get new uniforms for the basketball team? <laughs> yeah, and again, so, so that, 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 while that is not an end, it is, it is a prior, it is, it is an important piece. Um, typically, you know, if that is a priority, it comes to me through the budget process when I talk with the athletic director and we try to get it through the budget process. Um, but that's where we could potentially. You cannot use your, the operations fund for the money that was voted in there for athletics because that was not. The not intent. exactly. But that's where I'm. That's where I'm wondering if if we have this surplus, if we have the ability to say, yes. okay, we want an we want an additional enrichment, like we want an additional fund where we can we can put money in, and then we can already seed a PTA that can do work like what you're talking about, right? A PTA yeah. or PTO has to be a 501c3. Yeah. That, that's I understand yeah. it, right? So it couldn't, and you, it, it would have to be separate, independent from the school. I think yeah. the reason I'm But a school couldn't give a, a school couldn't help fund that through a, that. So we used to have a school club here and I think we were the only school of the three schools that had that. And we, it was for artists in residence oh, and that. like the big auction and all of that. Was that a 501c3? Separate from the school? I, because in my time. No, no, because I, I went through one of the auctions and it wasn't a, um, I didn't get a tax receipt. Yeah. So again, yeah, this hasn't been brought up through the budget process as a priority. <laughs> the reason I'm <laughs> going a little non sequitur here is because, again, my brain's always focused on academics and ends. These are valuable things. We just need to get people together to kind of talk about it. Well, so these favorite. are valuable you things, would, you like would an have opportunity to, for that. So what would have to happen is in the, the budget season, when it comes up this mm -hmm. year, the um, you would have to get the town to vote to both create a mm -hmm. pot a surplus mm -hmm. pot to put this money in that defines, you know, potentially in general what it's going to be used yeah. for and then get them vote to fund it. My concern is, is that if these are ongoing things that should be addressed in the perpetuity, be in the it should be in the regular budget. We shouldn't be going about it through this way. But that's what I'm thinking is that these are not things that may be. <laughs> yeah, if they're, if, they're, if they're special things above and beyond or once in a blue moon things. Yeah. That, that would be appropriate for, because remember, for me to access the money once it's there, I have to come to you. Yeah, yeah. But if, if it's ongoing issues, then that needs to be communicated during the budget process to me by a, the new AD who's here is really good. Um, ben, ben was good too, um, so that I can get it into the regular budget or try to get it into the regular budget. So those are the things that create a good culture. Yeah, right? agree. And engagement, which is what we're working on. Mm -hmm. So that's a good idea. So you could talk to the new AD and say, hey, are you budgeting for new uniforms? And yeah. encourage him to do that. And then there is a sports boosters. And I believe the sports boosters were looking for. It struck, it struck it, last year. Yeah, it yeah. I think they're year. looking yeah. for, for parents and community folks to be yeah. a part of the sports so. boosters and the sports boosters like, don't play any help. sports so i feel like that's a little bit strange but i mean <laughs> i don't know chelsea what i want you to do shoot me an email as a reminder okay um, because it has not come up in like my open forums i'm time. not saying the basketball team actually needs new uniforms but i'm just thinking like no but those are the things that make Yep. them proud to wear the uniform because it's new, it's current, it looks like the and latest. And these are things that get over, overlooked without that community engagement piece. Yeah. Like, you know, it's on our side too because of COVID in the last couple of years. Yes. I'm looking uh, forward so to just, working. Just so you know, there is, there is a vision for the athletic program. Oh, if good. I can get the RUHS up, um, the numbers up, we can never get it up to a thousand kids. Um, you're going to have a turf field out there with lights, with a big fence around it. And we are going to be, since we're central in the state, any of the year-end big championships will be run here. Uh, okay. So there has been a goal that's been discussed for a number of years. Uh, but we got to keep getting the enrollments up. Yeah. So. 
How many, what is the enrollment right now? Eight, uh, depending upon who you count in there, um, around 897. Um, it has been going up on average 12 students per year. Basically what it does is it, it sits level, jumps up, a year it'll sit level, it'll jump up, but on average it's not an official. So is, for sports teams, is, is Randolph division three? Three, or two? three. Three? Three. three. And where, when does it jump up to two? Uh, I'd have to go look at the... This one, the student body? Yeah, it, it usually depends upon the student enrollments. I'd have to look at the student Because yeah. yeah. usually the bigger, uh, the more students you have in the school, the more likely you're gonna have higher level, you got a bigger group of people who are gonna have a higher level. Yeah. yeah. Well, the baseball team's looking good for the future, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so good. And if the state ever comes through with the funding to, to do rebuilding, we're going to rebuild that high school. So, um, so we can hear on what the study committee comes back with this legislative session. They do match the funds, so that's on the building as well before I die. That's <laughs> exciting. Sometime in the future, hopefully far future. Anyway, I got shot pass. Okay, yeah. what's next? So, uh, any questions about any of the other reports? none we'll move forward so uh action my item recap um we're gonna we're gonna do the orientation oops was there something she wanted oh it just includes to a reminder that the negotiations right i was going to get to that I, the next. I apologize i okay i thought it was part of his superintendent's report no no this is just i'm just recapping what we're going to be working on the orientation or the orientation committee is going to meet we're going to figure out how we're going to do our little 15 minute orientation at the next meeting ownership linkage committee is going to meet um, and start creating the plan we're also i will reach out or the committee will reach out we'll reach out to the vsba and see if we um, can find a facility facilitator to help us with that i'm i'm thinking jackie might be a good person i think she was she brought up uh portrait of a graduate i think um if i remember correctly when she was doing her stuff with us so she might be somebody that we could use i know the vsba is using her um and we'll start working on that ownership linkage plan um and then I just we just had on here a reminder that negotiate we are going to negotiate again this year, yay! Um, so uh, the negotiating committees. Um, I have a new list. So in case you were wondering what committee you were on. Um, Teacher negotiations, that's Chelsea, Hannah, Megan. Um, support staff negotiations is me, uh, Katya, and Sarah. And uh, that is it. So those meetings, if I remember correctly, Lane, um, you will be reaching out. I'm going to reach out. Um, in the next to to get them month to, yeah. to just figure out when we might start the process. Do you know who uh, the lead negotiators will be? No. So just be prepared to be thinking about dates and times when you're available so that we can get that moving. All right, and um, that's it. Move to adjourn. So seconded. Seconded by Hannah. All those in favor, aye. We're out of here. <laughs>